So this is not the story about an incident, but the story about a man, my father, a poet, writer, life lifelong learner, and uh, it would not be odd for you to catch him reading the encyclopedia from cover to cover. And so, in telling the story of my father, uh, rather than tell it chronologically, I'm going to tell it the way it was intended, by subject in alphabetical order, much like an encyclopedia. A, alcohol. My father hated alcohol, hated the fact that people drank alcohol, hated the fact that it existed, and so when he found out that I started drinking at the ripe young age of 23, very disappointed. Man, Dust, why you gotta drink? Why can't you just smoke pot? <laughs> C, coach. My father was my football coach from age nine to 12. And so at age nine is approximately exactly when I realized that knowledge of the game is not a prerequisite to be a youth football coach. At single digits, I already understood the concept of down and distance at a much higher level than he did. So uh, he would make up for his lack of knowledge of the game, however, with inspirational speeches. You know, we didn't lose out there today, boys, he would say after we lost. We just ran out of time. You know, I realize now that makes no sense at all, but you know, nine-year-old Dustin, that was gold, that was brilliant. It stopped me from crying. I was great, you know? So uh, I also found out that he stole it from Vince Lombardi, but you know, for a brief period of time, he sounded like a legitimate coach to a bunch of nine-year-old boys. And uh, at age nine, we were not allowed to have the uh, coaches on the field anymore. So we needed to find a way to, to get the play call in from the sideline to the huddle. And most teams would rotate in a lineman or a, a running back or something like that to, to tell the quarterback. But um, we only had 12 guys and <laughs> In the time it took to run the 30 yards from the sideline to the huddle, uh, Georgie Latanzi would inevitably forget the play 85 to 98% of the time. <laughs> and so my father and I came up with this system of signals uh, in which basically uh, one side of the body was odd and one side was even. And the higher you go, the higher the number. Okay, it was basically just an easy way to convey 36 power into the huddle that a nine-year-old could understand. The 35-year-old who came up with this rudimentary system, however, did not understand it. More often than not, he would call a play that either didn't exist or couldn't possibly exist, and I'd look over at the sideline for the next play, and, and he, would, he would hit a part of his body, and then wave it off like, like he was a contestant on Password trying to get a celebrity to guess paella. It was like, you know, every play call looked like a man pantomiming, I just lost my key. <laughs> and so I became the only nine-year-old quarterback in uh, the entire world with complete play calling control. <laughs> yeah, take that, Peyton. <laughs> G, gambling. Papa was a gambling man. He, uh, he was known to go to the Borgata in Atlantic City more than once a week. He would deal his own backroom poker games and pool halls and, uh, you know, he... He bet on basketball, baseball, football. He eventually became a bookie, so he knew the odds. He knew how to play them. So when he found out that he had cancer, it was no surprise to us that he took the same approach. Uh, we went to, to Fox Chase Cancer Ward uh, to get a biopsy on a mole that he had to find out whether or not it was large cell or small cell cancer. Uh, apparently, one is better than the other. And um, the doctor uh, came out and told him, uh, Mr. Fisher, so there is a, uh, before we do this procedure, you should know there's a 30% chance that we're not gonna get anything. You're gonna need to come back again tomorrow. Uh, there's a 10% chance that uh, we, you're gonna have to stay here overnight and, and uh, we're gonna have to breathe through a tube. And um, there's a 20% chance that uh, we'll puncture a hole in your lung and you'll be coughing up blood for no more than 24 hours. 20% chance, Doc? Wow. That's, that's one word in an inside street, and I catch those all the time. <laughs> Pretty awesome to see an entire room of serious, somber people just bust into hysterical laughter. So. Okay, G, G, J, J, job. My, uh, my best friend, Tony, from college, uh, graduated the year after I did, and he landed a cushy government job making a lot of money, um, whereas I was still refing wiffle ball. 
for money at the college I graduated from. So when, uh, when my father heard the news, you know, he was, he was, he was torn, but he, you know, he was, oh, dust, you know, that's great, that's great news. You know, tell, tell Tony I, I, I'm happy for him. Tell him congratulations. Tell him I wish he was my son. <laughs> Technically, he never said instead of, anyway. So, M, money. Uh, although, <laughs> the, the fact that he's a gambler uh, does not mean he's good with money. In fact, uh, usually quite the opposite, uh, I'm finding. And so uh, I asked him one time uh, from college, I'm like, you know, hey, hey, Dad, can I get a loan? Yeah, sure, Dust, I'll leave you alone. <laughs> Not what I meant, Dad. Uh, M, R, uh, radiation. Uh, between radiation and chemotherapy, we were at Fox Chase uh, four times a week. In the beginning, I mean, he would sit there with his cane, uh, just talking with everybody that came by, the nurses, the doctors. He was fun, everybody knew who he was. Uh, I, I take him, I wheel him back into the changing room to get his radiation party toga on, which is it's what he called the standard hospital gown, and uh, wheel him back into the waiting room where we would talk. We'd talk about a lot of things, about baseball, Seinfeld, poker. We would rarely bring up his mortality. Uh, but after about a month of treatments, the medication made it impossible for him to hold on a conversation. And uh, so basically, you know, he would just sit there and stare at the wall. You know, people would walk by and say hi, and you know, he would seldom address them. And, and, and when he did, by the time the words got out of his mouth, they were just a jumbled mess. And he stopped paying attention to baseball. He couldn't watch television. He stopped shaving. He stopped making people laugh. Uh, he really just sat there and waited for the doctors to tell him what to do. T, technology. Now see, most computer knowledge that my generation has and takes for granted is probably as foreign to my father's generation as planes are to cod. And my father was not the sharpest cod in the drawer. I'll forgive him the time that he accidentally deleted a document and then reached out to the monitor to try to catch it like Coach did in Poltergeist. He didn't pull it back. But, uh, but he called me down in Maryland one time to tell me about an internet connection issue that he was having problems with uh, that was caused by the lack of a mouse pad. Okay, good, y'all got that. I thought he was pranking me again, uh, or just really wanted me to, to see me. And uh, this, this was a joke, but not one that he was in on. So I drove the two hours north and I gave him a, a Scarface mouse pad. And, uh, you know, he just, and lo and behold, it doesn't work. Surprise. So, well, of course it doesn't work, man. You, the, the thing hasn't had a thing since you brought it up here. Loosely interpreted, he still blamed the mouse pad. And, and now, of course it doesn't work because the mouse has been contaminated by all the prolonged, unprotected mousing that it's been doing. And I, quote, didn't know shit about shit. So he left to go out to buy a new mouse, and I diagnosed the problem and, and worked with the motherboard a little bit. And, uh, well, lo and behold, one of us was right. <laughs> T, uh, let's see, what comes after T? You, uh, you, uncomfortable. Okay, um, my, uh, there's a reason it's called uncomfortable. My dad, in finding out that I went skiing with a, a friend, Teresa, uh, that, that he, he'd been over to the house several times, you know, hey, hey, man, you know, how's Teresa? You know, she's still, she still good looking? Yes, Dad, she's still good looking, but, uh, but, but she chopped off all of her hair. I said, oh, dust. Short hair is sexy. I'm like, no, no, Dad, long hair is sexy. Short hair is cute. I'm like, ah, oh, dust, dust, short hair is sexy. You know, it's like, it's like you're having sex with like a little boy. <laughs> Sorry. W, worry. <laughs> now, I, I, uh, I was telling my dad, I was having problems at college, and, and I'm like telling him about it, you know, I don't know what it was, and he's, uh, you know, hey, hey, you know, Dust, Dust, I worry about you. I'm like, ah, there's no need to worry, no need to, I'll be, no, 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 I know, I know, I'm best son, but I do. And if I had another son, I wouldn't give a shit, but you're all I got. <laughs> Same fatherly support from, from before, job entry. Uh, W, or W, uh, excuse me, Y, young. Forever young, 
uh, by Bob Dylan is my father's favorite song. And my, uh, my mom, sister, and I uh, played it and sang it at his memorial service back in 2005 when he, he passed away. Um, I still think of him now for many reasons every time parenthood comes on. Z, Zen. Uh, I fancy myself a logical person. So I'm not necessarily a person to go screaming, why to the gods when bad things happen to good people? Okay, after smoking for 45 years and playing in an asbestos plant as a child, you know, it's just lung cancer just wasn't a long shot. And like my father, I believe in odds and probability. And so I'm okay. I'm okay with this. You know, don't cry because it's over, but smile because it happened. My father didn't lose his battle with lung cancer. He just ran out of time. Thank you.